I focus more on the boarding school uh, within Alaska. Uh, and the title of my presentation today is A Reindeer in Caribou's Clothing. Uh, and the reasoning behind that is uh, uh, obviously Sheldon Jackson's uh, persona within uh, a lot of the media that talks about him, uh, portrays him in a very positive light. Uh, and that a lot of the times is due to uh, uh, mainly uh, like Presbyterian denominations and different entities uh, that have used him a hero uh, for a number of different reasons. Yet, whenever you look at not only uh, testimonies from indigenous peoples of the legacy that he created, but also even from his primary source material, uh, you get definitely a bigger uh, and very different picture. And so whenever you're reading a lot of these things, uh, especially in terms of the boarding schools, we like to think of it only in terms of historical trauma. Uh, usually that's the lens that we frame it in. Yet uh, something uh, that uh, I believe uh, that we should do is take a much bigger uh, picture in looking at it. And we, uh, over at the Heritage Center, we look at it through the structural violence model uh, my, uh, by Johan Golkung, which we'll talk about later. Uh, but uh, to start it off, uh, I'm going to tell you a story about my grandfather. Uh, so my grandfather, Mac Dolchak, was over in uh, Kenai growing uh, very early, uh, growing up uh, before he was taken actually to boarding school. And during that time, he was, uh, he was actually doing set netting with his brother, which in interestingly enough was Max Dolchak, uh, Max and Lisa, uh, were with Family Wellness Warriors for a while over at South Central Foundation. But Max, Mac, everyone gets them mixed up because great grandpa ended up uh, probably not being the most creative with names uh, during that time. Uh, but they're over set netting. And this is before there was a road to Kenai. Uh, and so a lot of the times they didn't see as many people from, you know, Anchorage or outside uh, that were, you know, uh, just there to go fishing, you know, recreationally. Uh, but they saw this one guy over on the coast, and it looked like he was throwing something out. Uh, he looked like he had a stick and was throwing it out. And uh, first tide came in, uh, both my grandfather and his brother uh, started, yeah, catching fish, pulling in the set net, picking the net cleaned everything out, uh, and then they looked over, and the guy was still there, uh, and just really confused, got everything cleaned up in a matter of time, and while they were waiting for the second uh, tide to come in, they just, the guy just kept on casting out, uh, he was obviously, you know, doing a fish and reel kind of thing, uh, rod and reel kind of thing, uh, but they hadn't really seen that before, and so, uh, my grandpa actually looks over to his brother and asks, is he trying to catch them one at a time? Uh, which he obviously was. And so they, uh, second tide comes in, they pick the net, the other guy still hasn't caught anything using rod and reel. And so they go over and they take a couple of fish uh, that hadn't been uh, cut up yet and brought it to him. And they said, you need this more than I do, which the guy responded by saying, no, I want to catch them the right way. And it was at that time that my grandfather said, it sounds like the right way is a great way to not have fish. And that, that's really what we're trying to do with the structural violence model in terms of actually uh, as opposed to just capturing one aspect of the boarding school uh, era and what it has done uh, to Alaska Natives, taking a much broader uh, picture and actually understanding the full extent, uh, the full net of fish as to what, how it has affected all of us Alaska Natives as a people uh, and where all of those things came from. 
And so, yeah, uh, to uh, start it off, uh, a lot of, whenever we talk about the boarding schools, uh, a lot of the times churches do get brought up, especially in the Canadian context. Uh, churches a lot of the times uh, have been, uh, in sometimes uh, the main focus, other times not so much. But it's really important to understand where all of these structures originate. Um, and something that if you've looked into boring schools or in indigenous issues altogether, uh, the thing that usually pops up several times is the discussion on the Doctrine of Discovery, otherwise known as Intercedra, or the Alexandrian Bulls, uh, where it was a papal bull uh, given by uh, Pope, one of the, uh, Pope Alexander, uh, which gave all the lands in North and South America uh, to a couple uh, of European countries or states. And the stipulation was is that we're giving these lands over to uh, these quote Christian princes, which will then go over and not only finally work the land, but then to go over and also teach and educate these indigenous people, basically to convert indigenous peoples. Uh, and this, uh, the reason why they believed uh, that they were able to do it, because they believed that Alaska natives, North American, uh, uh, Native Americans, uh, any indigenous peoples actually really had never heard about God. And so they were, quote, the, the unheard or the uh, that had never been saved or had never heard about, uh, uh, about God. And so as a result, uh, they were not actually, we weren't actually understood as real people. Uh, and so uh, there, there are two parts of this, uh, the part of these European countries laying claim to the land. But on the other hand, there is that educational reality where the Christian princes had to educate or convert uh, these indigenous populations. And that, that ultimately culminated into something called uh, the Catholic missions um, uh, used to go over and convert uh, indigenous peoples. Uh, but what that ends up happening for the American church uh, is they wanted to have claim uh, to these lands via intercedra or the doctrine and discovery. And so a lot of the times they had to, they would then have to go over and create a reality or an ideology for understanding themselves through this Catholic document. Because uh, the majority of founding fathers and people that came before them were actually Protestant, uh, which I don't know if you know very much about uh, the Catholics and the Protestants, but especially 16th century, 17th century onward, they typically did not like each other uh, and did not write great things about each other. Uh, but you, uh, in terms of the system in which they started to create uh, this understanding with where they would become the inheritors of intracetera. Uh, you see murmurings throughout American history. Uh, for instance, uh, God's chosen nation, uh, uh, the, the city on the hill. Uh, you see other th sermons from uh, people like Cotton, uh, Cotton Weathers, uh, also like John Witherspoon. Uh, so you start to see it pop up, but not it to actually become solidified within the American identity. Uh, that is until uh, around 1819, uh, where the Civilization Act came about. And through that, uh, a lot of these various mainline denominations, specifically Protestant, start to actually come together and systematize uh, their theology to match not only intercedera, uh, but all the, also these funding opportunities that are coming through throughout uh, the uh, throughout the federal government. And uh, a lot of these different entities start to create uh, these different theologies, but the one that I'm going to focus on specifically is something called Princeton theology, uh, where 
individuals uh, like Charles Hodge, Archibald Alexander, B.B. Warfield uh, got together and started to create this theology. Uh, now, Protestantism, uh, just to go on a little side note, uh, Presbyterianism uh, is something that comes from an individual named John Calvin uh, from Geneva. And his ideology, uh, uh, some, one thing that he's famous for is his doctrine of election. And when you look at the doctrine of election within his institutes of Christian religion, you start to see that uh, his understanding of election is very individualistic. And that, that means that, uh, that God chooses individuals to become peoples of God. Uh, God does not choose whole people groups, just individuals. And you're either in or you're completely out. Uh, and so that was John Calvin, uh, his, very individualistic within his theological frameworks. But then you move over into uh, Princeton theology and a lot of these other different theologies that are popping up at the same time, uh, where they actually take a complete 180 turn and start saying that God chooses nations as opposed to just individuals. Uh, something that goes completely against John Calvin's belief system is actually the first time that you start to see a systematic national, uh, nationalistic uh, version of Christianity within reformational thought. Uh, so what, what that ultimately means is that this belief, uh, the, these churches started going from very individualistic belief systems to very national uh, systems where God doesn't choose just only a few people, but God actually chooses nations. And what that ends up becoming is uh, kind of, to use biblical terms, uh, like a modern day Israel, which is the United States of America, all the way over. Uh, and on the other end, you have the indigenous peoples, which become somewhat of the new Canaanites uh, or uh, the new people to be exterminated so that we can get their land. Uh, within the boarding school reality, uh, there were just two choices, uh, either change everything that uh, every aspect of you uh, that represents these quote new Canaanites and become part of this new Israel or ultimately die a Canaanite or an indigenous person. And uh, as a result, uh, whenever we, uh, the, the churches started actually becoming more and more ingrained uh, and started actually creating this boarding school system. Uh, I like to break it down into three different eras. Uh, there is the ecclesial era uh, from the civilization on act, uh, uh, on to 1879, uh, where it was mainly churches running the ball game. Uh, there weren't really any uh, strictly federal entities. It was mainly just churches doing their own thing uh, all the way, all around uh, the United States. Uh, you then move into the modern, um, the more Carlisle era or the mon mon monetarization, modernization, I apologize, era. Uh, where you start to see uh, boarding schools being understood more as uh, kind of what we've come to believe is kind of like the Carlisle perspective or the General Pratt perspective, uh, where boarding schools were thought very close to be very close to uh, pris uh, native prison camps, uh, that whole kill the Indian, save the man reality, uh, and kind of the uh, where they, to some extent, uh, created a system that was then brought to other, other nations like Canada. Uh, and then you have the BIA era, where uh, the Bureau of Indian Affairs, uh, through Roosevelt, actually took over every aspect, uh, all these different schools, and started running them. And uh, a lot of the times where we look at this kind, uh, uh, this breaking down of the different eras, you would just think that the churches were involved with the first. Uh, but really, uh, throughout even in, uh, even in Carlisle, uh, you start to see 
uh, whenever you start to look at how the churches were involved, even at Carlisle Industrial Indian School in Pennsylvania, you start to realize that they had their hand uh, in that institution and all the institutions that came after that, uh, uh, ultimately helping run these places and create these different frameworks. Uh, in fact, even where the Bureau of Indian Affairs took over uh, the boarding schools, many times the heads of these various boarding schools would come from a lot of these mainline denominations. Uh, if it wasn't a school that still remained within uh, the denomination. And so even though you see different kind of eras, it's really important to recognize uh, the church's hand in every single reality of this. Uh, for instance, uh, I'm uh, over in Anchorage right now, uh, but a lot of my family ended up going, uh, you know, from Kenai ended up going up to uh, being sent over to a Klutna boarding school. And if you start to look at the records, a lot of uh, the leadership within Aklutna were actually from the American Baptist Church. And so uh, just keeping that in mind as we keep on going through and recognizing the hand of these various denominations throughout these different boarding schools. Now, uh, in terms of uh, the very early on stages of the boarding schools, uh, and especially from like Princeton theology, it's just a really good framework to use throughout this whole thing. Uh, you start to see a lot of these different mission boards uh, start experimenting uh, on how to run these boarding schools, or at this point, mainly day schools over in Oklahoma. Uh, the Presbyterians use the foreign board of missions, while others just use their uh, very generic mission boards. Uh, and you start to see a lot of the first uh, uh, boarding schools that weren't necessarily day schools, that kind of differentiation occurring. Uh, you see that with the Union Boarding School, uh, the boarding school over with the Osage, and especially Spencer Academy. And whenever, uh, and that this is really the place in Spencer Academy where you see this hard differentiation. Uh, there was an individual named Robert Loutridge. Uh, he's actually the earliest person that I can find uh, that makes this kind of a claim, uh, where he actually states that he used to run a day school uh, over in Muskogee Creek uh, territory. Uh, but he ended up, uh, after that kind of failed, he went back to the denomination and told them that we need to take these children away from their families because they might go to school, but they always go back to their bows and arrows. Uh, and from that, uh, you start to see this more uh, bent towards taking these children away and bringing them to these various uh, schools that are away from their families. Uh, and he starts talking about uh, making these kinds of claims back in the 1840s or so, uh, uh, over uh, in the, within Oklahoma, uh, had a hand Spencer Academy. Uh, around the 1860s, though, that was the point where Sheldon Jackson actually uh, graduated uh, and started doing work over in Oklahoma at Spencer Academy, uh, and that that's real. That's also where he interacted with Robert Woutrich. And as we start to see uh, this whole idea of taking children away from their communities uh, in order to change every aspect from them uh, kind of starts here in Oklahoma. Uh, but it's also really important to point out that uh, Sheldon Jackson and both Robert Woutridge were students of people like Charles Hodge, uh, who created this kind of nationalistic ideology uh, that fueled the boarding schools. Uh, and so what, what ended up happening with Sheldon Jackson, uh, to spend his time over in Spencer Academy, but then ended up having a little bit of uh, a disagreement with the Foreign Board of Missions, and then ended up going to the Board of Home Missions. And as a result, uh, he ended up becoming superintendent of, for the most part, most of the entire western half of the U.S., except for coastal areas. 
uh, that that and we still keep on finding places that he was superintendent of for a certain time during this like 1960 uh, or 1860s, 1960s is weird, but from these 1860s to about uh, 1880s. Uh, he, uh, he was a superintendent of Wisconsin, Minnesota, Wyoming, Montana, Utah, Arizona, New Mexico, Colorado, and the list ultimately keeps on going. It's also important to realize that while he was superintendent within his own denomination, uh, there he was also uh, a dual having a dual role, role as a U.S. Indian agent. This is something you see very uh, see some uh, see that's actually very common uh, with these different people who are working or the heads of these different churches who are also going over and working um, working within these different boring schools. Um, but the question always pops up as to uh, like, like what is the purpose really behind this? Uh, you know, a as opposed to assimilation, uh, th there had to be something else. And uh, this is actually one document that we found uh, looking through various church archives uh, where you actually see uh, it, it talks about this school uh, or this uh, tribe, uh, the, these different groups over in Wyoming, uh, who actually uh, have been very resistant to mining in their area, specifically uh, Sweetwater Mine. And what the Presbyterian Church uh, ultimately suggests, uh, which, which this is tr uh, all throughout the, all the various denominations, uh, but Specifically, the Presbyterians uh, suggest playing churches and also schools to subdue native populations in order to gain access to natural resources. Interestingly enough, um, or actually sadly enough, Sheldon Jackson is the one that ultimately carries it out. And that, that's a trend that you start seeing throughout uh, Sheldon Jack not only Sheldon Jackson's work, but many others where the boarding schools are just a method to get a hold of the natural resources in the area uh, uh, so that the tribe, the indigenous peoples aren't really a problem. Uh, and so, and keep in mind, another thing that is just really jarring reading uh, these kinds of documents is he talks about, uh, they talk about how there is uh, that, like, this is plan A uh, to be able to, quote, domesticate the indigenous population. But if that fails, uh, he talks, of, uh, there's talk within this document about how if that fails, then there's an army barracks just right down the road uh, with uh, many, many men uh, who will be able to, quote, take care of. Of this problem. And so uh, under, understanding the link between resource extraction and also boarding schools is very essential in trying to ac actually understand the systems uh, that were created that actually affect us Native peoples today. And so now in talking, uh, we're uh, going to finally talk about Alaska specifically. Uh, Sheldon Jackson uh, still associated with the Board of Home Missions uh, ends up taking control of most of the Western half of the United States, and then uh, ultimately comes up to Alaska. And uh, there are various sources uh, within his correspondence where it talks about the fact that he wants to be known as the Napoleon of the West uh, or the Presbyterian Napoleon. Uh, because if he ended up gaining control of Alaska, then he would own, he would be in charge of more land uh, than almost anyone, including Napoleon. Uh, but on top of that, it's also important to recognize uh, that regardless of their views, and especially in going into our own history, recognizing that regardless of how they viewed indigenous people, you know, us, those who came before us and those who come after us, uh, it's also to rec is important to recognize 
uh, who we are, uh, regardless of what they stated, uh, as strong indigenous peoples. And so, uh, in carrying on, uh, talking about Sheldon Jackson, uh, he ended up coming up here and helping found. Uh, th there are a couple of other documents that say that someone in a very romanticized version said that a native person uh, formed for Wrangell, but those really don't, they show up in his public writings, not necessarily as private, uh, which uh, we is, is rather suspicious. But uh, essentially he came up and helped found uh, Fort Wrangell uh, over in Southeast Alaska. Uh, uh, something that, uh, you know, uh, obviously ended up spreading. And what's really interesting whenever you're looking at Fort Wrangell uh, and looking at that date, uh, we've been starting to find a lot of photos. Uh, uh, the one up top is a great example of that, of children over in Fort Wrangell and different institutions throughout Alaska, uh, where a lot of the male children were uh, supposed, uh, were actually dressed in military garb. Uh, something uh, that a lot of the times we associate specifically with Carlisle. And that this is a whole nother topic uh, for a whole nother discussion, but We've been finding photos uh, from Fort, the original Fort Wrangell uh, that date actually to 1877. And it's really important to recognize that Carlisle Industrial Indian School, who's very, uh, uh, who's very, which is an institution that's incredibly infamous for mi the militarization of the boarding schools actually opened two years later, uh, which is some of the more, some of the most early evidence that a lot of the ideas that Carlisle uh, became famous for were actually perfected in places like Alaska, uh, you know, through the churches. And so just a really important thing to recognize how widespread this kind of, uh, the churches were in specifically Sheldon Jackson uh, uh, and uh, in influencing these different groups. And so ultimately uh, within uh, Fort Wrangell, Sheldon Jack and all the other boarding schools, uh, the funding for these uh, were both and, uh, both public funding uh, through the feds, uh, while at the same time, private funding uh, that came through not only the Presbyterian Church, but many, many different denominations. Uh, and he was really, really successful in doing so. Uh, one of his publications, the North Star, uh, uh, was really popular in producing that kind of revenue uh, through the private funders. Uh, and it, uh, I will say uh, that if you ever do uh, find a copy of the North Star. Uh, it it's a very gruesome read, and so just just a heads up uh, if you end up uh, reading through it, there are a lot of very disturbing things in there. Uh, yeah, so just uh, just to warn you on that one. Uh, but these kinds of realities. Uh, led to and him trying to create this kind of boarding school quote, empire uh, in Alaska ended up not working so well uh, because there were other boarding schools that started popping up. And so something that uh, we talk about a lot uh, when talking about Sheldon Jackson or just the boarding school history in Alaska is the 1880 comedy plan. Uh, and it's one of those things that are that's really tricky in talking about it because most of the sources that have been cited up to this point have been secondary in nature, uh, usually from uh, Stewart's book uh, or Pathfinder, uh, Sh uh, Shelton Jackson's book. A lot of these different entities have actually talked about the comedy plan, but never a lot of these people have never were never actually there or.
had only heard about it in passing. And what's really interesting about, uh, really great about uh, some of the stuff we've been doing here at the Heritage Center is that we've actually found the primary source documents that actually talk about the comedy plan. Uh, their notes and even the map right now we're in the process of publishing. Uh, but uh, what is really interesting and really uh, especially um, in uh, it, th that's really sad when you're reading through their meeting uh, in New York in the 188 comedy plan. Uh, and what they talked about is that really education uh, is something that was rarely ever talked about at that at that meeting that lasted only a handful of hours. Uh, really, the reason why they split up Alaska in the way that they did, uh, Episcopalian, Moravian, Baptist, Methodist, Congregational, uh, Presbyterian, uh, uh, is it mainly all had to do with natural resource extraction uh, so that they weren't going on top of each other whenever they actually claimed the land that they did. Uh, in, uh, yeah, and really, uh, whenever we look at whenever the Catholics started uh, coming into Alaska, uh, there's this one section uh, of land uh, that they thought was barren, and so their thought was, let's give it to the Catholics, uh, especially, uh, which, uh, especially when you consider that these were mainly Protestant individuals who were, uh, who were in this meeting, it makes sense that they were just going to give whatever they had left over to the Catholics. Uh, and so, ultimately, this, uh, like I said, the comedy plan, all these various denominations coming together, this is one of the first Protestant, mainline Protestant uh, comedy plans uh, ever. And all the people that showed up to this meeting were all the heads of these various uh, uh, boards, uh, you know, mission, uh, Protestant mission boards. And a lot of these same people, including John Reed of the Methodist Church, uh, were, so, were also at play over in Canada. And their comedy plan actually happened just a little bit after ours. Uh, and so uh, this, in recognizing that this is the first time that these individuals uh, came to the table all together as a result of Sheldon Jackson uh, uh, and brought this framework uh, not only to Canada, but throughout the rest of the world uh, is r rather frightening whenever you start to really think about the implications uh, of what happened uh, in terms of how they were trying to colonize Alaska. Uh, on top of that, they actually, we, ha we found writings where they actually talk about then forming a special committee, a uh, congressional committee, uh, where they would actually help influence how the boarding schools were created at that point, uh, and uh, basically where all the money for the federal government was coming from. Uh, uh, but again, it's really important to recognize uh, that it was this framework uh, of not only these churches coming together, but this framework of all these of Sheldon Jackson uh, and his influence uh, that has had widespread and terrible uh, results uh, for indigenous peoples throughout the world. Uh, uh, and that also includes uh, the use of his curriculum, uh, which was sent to various places, uh, uh, his hand in actually creating uh, the matron system throughout the uh, that uh, was just widespread. Uh, if you go to if you go to Oklahoma, uh, even uh, you'll hear about matrons just as you will over in Alaska, uh, a system that was ultimately created by Jackson himself. Uh, uh, yeah, and so you you start to see a lot of these different realities coming together, all during the exact same time. Um, a lot of the times we think of Jackson's ideology as being 
very you know pro-native or trying to preserve culture yet uh if you look at the picture down below when he's that this is actually uh part of a a certificate you would get if you gave money to uh to the building to a uh, creation of a couple more buildings over at fort wrangell but if you look over towards the bottom uh there is that uh he has this picture that is more than likely just something that is made up uh uh, that he calls Heathen Dance Alaska. Uh, and so make no mistake in that whenever he is creating these systems for the extraction of natural resources, that's really what he has his eye on. Not Definitely not education, but also uh, recognizing only us as ultimately savages and our culture as being something for him just to wipe away. Uh, and so uh, his his impact within Alaska uh, incredibly great. Uh, in 1880, uh, there were only a few. 1885, there were maybe 13 uh, boarding schools. Uh, we we see that in his educational reports. But by 1893 uh, or 1894 you start to see well over 41 boarding schools, 41 plus boarding schools that were in existence. And that's within less than a 10 year time span. Uh, BIA, uh, uh, Bureau of Indian Affairs, uh, is actually starting to calculate within uh, uh, Alaska that there were at least, and definitely more, but there were at least 55 boarding schools total that were identified. Uh, but it's also, uh, which would make us, you know, right behind Oklahoma in terms of how many boarding schools uh, were in existence in our state. Um, uh, but keep in mind that the total number is very much so unknown. Uh, and just to highlight how uh, he actually understood Alaska, Sheldon Jackson understood Alaska Native culture. Uh, this, this is actually a picture from one of his educational reports. Uh, and it's something that we've seen time and time again, uh, especially from Carlisle, uh, where uh, you see a Native person uh, in, quote, a savage state. And also, I, I still don't know why he put a TP on there. That, that's always really confusing to me, uh, especially since talking about people in uh, more Yubik territory. But uh, anyways, uh, you, you see someone over in uh, being labeled as a quote Eskimo boy in a savage state. In the very next photo though, you see David uh, who is in school where he has his hair cut, uh, he's wearing Western clothes. But it's really important to recognize the nuance that before David was just a savage. It was only until he cut his head, his hair, uh, and dressed in this Western uh, Western wear that he finally has a name. And so it's really important to recognize this personhood. Uh, in one side. Uh, wearing exactly what uh, his people have worn for centuries, but on the other side, finally having personhood because they believe he is assimilated. And surprisingly, that's not the most uh, confusing part uh, because in the very next page of Sheldon Jackson's education report, you see uh, Mrs. Kilbuck wearing regalia uh, and so it, it's really important to recognize, uh, and it's, wait, wait, uh, first of all, that you have to have, oh, you have to take part in a lot of mental gymnastics in order to actually rationalize this as a person, which obviously Ms. Kilbuck, Mrs. Kilbuck did, but also uh, it's really important to recognize that while David in regalia is understood just to be as a savage. Uh, Mrs. Kilbuck in regalia is something to be actually celebrated. Uh, 
And that, that, that's a common theme that we see throughout Shelton Jackson's work. Uh, when, uh, now, in terms of talking about Sheldon Jackson and Alaska Native culture, uh, it's really, really murky. Uh, uh, if you look at it from uh, w without reading his primary source material, uh, obviously, uh, want to eradicate the culture, but also on the other hand, he really liked our artwork, uh, which is. Uh, something that uh, it is very well known. Uh, and in fact, he would actually take a lot of the artwork. Uh, uh, he was known to be grave robbing for a very long time. Uh, a lot of artwork up until the time that uh, I, I think it was on a John Muir, uh, uh, a John Muir uh, voyage, uh, whenever he was with him, that John Muir actually talks about how he got just beat up uh, by a Quinket guy uh, for trying to cut a piece of uh, a cemetery um, uh, object. Uh, yeah, and so after that, he believed I probably shouldn't start. I really don't want to get beat up again, especially by someone from Southeast. So with his, uh, he started actually having these children uh, go and make uh, various cultural objects uh, so that uh, not only would he would be not only so that he would be able to uh, build up his own personal collection, but he actually had several agreements with a lot of different people, uh, a lot of different Protestant institutions uh, throughout uh, the East Coast, where he would actually take all these items and show them. Uh, over in these seminaries, universities, uh, and that, that was mainly two, uh, uh, there were two sides to that. One, he would go over and sell them to fund or give them to funders, a lot of these items that children would make, uh, or uh, he would show them uh, right, right alongside a lot of the grave robbed items and uh, to show them, quote, what they were trying to save us from, uh, which again, just, uh, it, it shows not only uh, in terms of trying to eradicate culture, uh, but also shows how we actually understood culture uh, or Alaska Native culture in that whenever it was in the hands of Alaska Natives, it was understood as something to be eradicated, uh, that it was, uh, quote, savage or something that was heathen. Uh, yet, whenever these items were in his possession, it was something to be celebrated. And so what that ends up making is the Alaskan native, the indigenous individual, as really the root cause of the evil, not the object or the culture themselves. Uh, which, yeah, uh, which ultimately leaves uh, the fact that it would it would not matter what Alaskan natives or indigenous peoples throughout North America actually did. Uh, what really mattered was not only who we were, but what was around us uh, that they could take. Many times it was even our own bodies. Uh, but again, that's a that's a whole nother topic for another time. Uh, but yeah, uh, going over and using our various forms of art and our various forms of culture uh, for his own uh, monetary uh, benefit. Uh, and there are other ta tactics within the boarding schools that were used to ultimately try and, quote, domesticate Alaskan natives, uh, one of which was actually through farming and ranching. Uh, farming in the boarding schools is really interesting. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, Eleanor, an elder, told me about how one time they actually tried to teach her how to grow carrots. And... <laughs> <laughs> uh, she's like, I don't think this is going to work. And the teacher's like, just, just do it anyway. Because uh, they were trying to ultimately turn us into farmers. And so 
She ends up trying to do it. After a couple months, they try and pull the carrot, and the carrot ends up only being about like that big, like smaller than many carrots. And that's because we have something called the permafrost at that point. And so uh, really not uh, setting Alaska natives up for uh, for success, but really just uh, to get us out of the way uh, for the purpose of natural resource extraction. Uh, the other thing, uh, and you see other things such as mining uh, uh, in order to turn us into very cheap labor uh, for said mines uh, so that they would be able to uh, not have to import people uh, to uh, work in terms of extracting these resources. Uh, the other way, uh, which I allude to over inside my presentation title, is through reindeer. And keep in mind, there were people that were, uh, there was a famine up north, mainly due to whaling, overwhelming by non-native populations, uh, uh, you know, uh, putting a stress on the ecosystem. But Sheldon Jackson, whenever he actually talks about it in his correspondence uh, with people in the Presbyterian Church, the Baptist Church, Methodist Church, and also the federal government, uh, his rationale uh, is very different from what he talks about in public. Uh, really, he continually talks about this domestication uh, and that we'll be able to get uh, this indigenous culture, this pride, this identity outside uh, you know, pull it out of the, quote, savages. And so for him, that, that was really his rationalization uh, to go over and to domesticate Alaska Native peoples, uh, not necessarily for the purpose of actually trying to help feed uh, these various villages. It also gets a little weird with reindeer. Uh, I read a report from after Jackson died, where he actually talks about uh, uh, where the person in charge of the reindeer program, because by that point, a lot of people were laying, go, laying their herds go uh, and into the caribou population, uh, just kind of, you know, it is what it is. Uh, but what uh, ended up happening uh, was one of the rationalizations for reindeer for them at that point was for transportation because uh, herding wasn't going so well. Uh, and th there's this crazy idea that uh, that riding bareback reindeer would be the future for transportation in Alaska. It's, it's, <laughs> it's definitely written by someone who knows that the reader will not be visiting Alaska. Uh, but anyway, reindeer for uh, Jackson specifically was a way uh, so to actually domesticate the population. Uh, not only was that uh, uh, the purpose, one of the purposes, but also uh, trying to change the Alaskan native diet and also to break up our family tribal structures, uh, which also meant breaking up resistance and also our own identity. Uh, because if you have a hunter-gatherer lifestyle, and then uh, you're forced to go over and start herding reindeer, that is going to put a huge change upon uh, not only the way that you see the world around you, but also your place within said world. Now, uh, in terms of reading a lot of what Sheldon Jackson, uh, within his own uh, reality, uh, what with reading his own uh, private letters, uh, his own writings, reading primary source material, it, it's, and especially with him still being revered today, uh, it should really be uh, necessary for us to take more of a historical or even a so source uh, critical approach uh, in recognizing that Sheldon Jackson's representation to non-native arenas has been mainly the prevalent uh, narrative uh, concerning his involvement in Alaska, even though, and throughout the rest of North America, even though he created a lot of the systems, uh, these boarding school systems that had been perfected in places like Wrangell, 
um, that we see on the news today in Canada as being absolutely horrific and seeing uh, the, the implications of that and the number uh, of people uh, that uh, are being found over in Canada. Uh, so it's re it, you should, uh, in recognizing the history, it's also important to see where a lot of these narratives are coming from and that they are coming from very non-native arenas. Uh, while a lot of the native stories are very much so different. Uh, and in fact, his own primary source material incredibly conflicts uh, with a lot of the stuff that has been written with him today in terms of him as being a hero, uh, yet taking part in all of these areas of not only conquest, uh, but also uh, colonization. Uh, but yeah, uh, we should recognize uh, native, uh, the native representation within these stories uh, to act uh, as not only valid, uh, but really uh, as seeing how, you know, what, what kind of effects Jackson has done within the general native population. Uh, it, it, we should also recognize when looking at Jackson a lot of the implied uh, or sometimes very out there imperialistic and colonization that's been romanced, uh, romanticized at the expense of indigenous identities. Uh, because for Jackson, very upfront about the fact that he wanted to eradicate the, um, you know, our native and cultural identity, uh, something that you in United Nations Permanent Forum for Indigenous Issues uh, has deemed as cultural genocide. Uh, and so recognizing uh, this kind of romanticized imperialism within when talking about Jackson, but also recognizing the fact that his main goal in all of this was resource extraction. That the boarding schools were just one method to get the things that were around us, the resources that were around us. Uh, and part uh, in eradicating our culture was a significant part, but really that was one of the final aims. Uh, it's also really important uh, to recognize what that means for us Native peoples today. Uh, what, what not only this narrative, uh, does to us today, but the systems that he created. How does it affect us Native peoples today? And the thing is, is that uh, within the state of Alaska, there is no statewide curriculum that teaches about the atrocities and cultural genocide that took place at Shelton Jackson's boarding schools, Rigel Institute, or any other boarding school within Alaska that took this framework. Uh, also, most church, most people do not know about or acknowledge the boarding schools within Alaska. And that also goes towards the churches, because a lot of these various denominations actually don't know their own history. Uh, there's really no edu real education about Sheldon Jackson outside of these romanticized imperialistic uh, realities. And in fact, as a result of all these things, we've been unable to connect these structures of violence with what has happened. Uh, and uh, recognizing uh, what that actually uh, means for us, not only those who came before us, but us, us today, and what that means for those who come after us. And so as a result, we use uh, more of a structural violence model, uh, which is something that was created by a uh, Nobel Peace Prize uh, recipient, Johan Goltung, who states and defines structural violence as the cause of the difference between the potential and the actual, between what has happened and what is. And it's really important because what this means is we can actually look at how this has affected communities versus just individuals. Uh, it also means that it affects uh, 
uh, all indigenous peoples. And when you recognize that it affects all of us, what that means is that we can recognize that we actually are never alone in the things that we face. Uh, on top of that, it also recognizes that even though a lot of names have changed uh, and masks have been uh, switched out as well, it recognizes the structures that continually uh, create forms of oppression for indigenous peoples. Uh, and for Johan Goltung, uh, he states that there are usually five indicators that tell you whether or not you there is structural violence. Uh, uh, and before that, he talks about a lot, talks a lot about how uh, violence is usually understood as both physical and a one-on-one -on -one reality. When a lot of many times, uh, violence takes many forms. Uh, especially structural. And so his five indicators have to do with the first one being violence that is psychological or and or physical, which turns into a cycle. And in terms of the boarding schools, we've seen both uh, physical and psychological uh, real trauma uh, in realities uh, start to make its way from generation to generation. Uh, the second one is violence that was positively or negatively influenced. And a great way that I like to explain it is if someone starts with a, a phrase with, well, at least we gave you, it, <laughs> that, that's usually a great indicator, uh, regardless of whatever comes next, uh, in trying to positively influence uh, what has been done. One of my favorite phrases uh, just because it was so bad, was someone saying, well, at, yeah, sure, boring schools, all that stuff. That was really bad, but at least we gave you refrigerators. And like, we're we're in Alaska. Like, that's the one thing we kind of don't need right now, uh, except for maybe a few months here and there. Uh, but uh, that at least we gave you uh, is a great determined, uh, great indicator as to violence which is possibly influenced. Another one is violence if there's a hurt object that exists. And what this is getting at is also, you know, the unseen pain that comes about as a result of violence. That might be a little bit hard to pinpoint, but that is actually there. Uh, and that, that's a lot of times where historical trauma comes in, uh, where there is this unseen pain that affects us. Uh, next one is a physical subject that acts. And something that I talked about earlier was that many times we think of it as one-on-one. -on -one. It's really easier, really easy to point at one person uh, or one group and say uh, that, that that is really the only thing that needs to go away and then we're good. Meanwhile, uh, that person or group ends up creating these kinds of structures uh, where uh, that actually normalizes, that become normalized, which ultimately normalize these forms of violence, uh, many times uh, having to do with native identity, uh, something that I'll talk about in just a little bit. And the last one is whether this event was unintended or intended by the subject. And when you look at what Sheldon Jackson was trying to do, and the implications that it has for Alaska Natives today, uh, and not only Alaska Natives, all indigenous peoples today, you recognize that there were some intended realities that go right alongside his own goals. Uh, so I would say both unintended and also intended. Uh, and the ways that we see structural violence today as Alaska Natives through what Sheldon Jackson had done uh, in creating uh, these kinds of structures uh, uh, in terms of dehumanizing Alaska natives and taking away identity, not only uh, the public persona of who we are as Alaska natives, but also the individual uh, reality and how we understand ourselves what we've seen is that dad does tell a story that 
because of this lack of identity, this emptiness. Uh, more than four in, Amer four in five American Indians and Alaska Native women have experienced violence in their own lifetime. One out of two Alaska Native uh, American Indian women have experienced sexual violence in their lifetime. 40% uh, Native incarceration rate. Uh, there was a 60% Native, 60% uh, Native children in foster care. Uh, you have suicide rates four times the national average. The list continues to go on and on and on. Cer certain things that we see not only from SAMHSA, uh, but also uh, through like MMIW, Missing Emerging Indigenous Peoples, uh, you, you start to see all these forms of violence that have actually become normalized, mainly uh, as a result of this lack of identity, not only the public, but also within all of us. And so at this point, what uh, we, uh, for us, we, we see a lot of these things, but like usually for all native audiences, I don't really go through this because it's something that every sing that has affected every single one of us today. And while that may be true, it's also really important to recognize that while there is pain and while there is violence, there is still a call to healing. And this is something that we actually call historical healing. That though ultimately the more that we understand, the more that we research, the easier it is to bring healing to the next generation. Because for a lot of us, we don't know why this happened uh, or why would this, why is this allowed to happen or why do I feel this way? And so the more research that we do, the more we're able to recognize what not only happened to us, but what continues to happen to us as Alaskan Natives. You know, also recognizing how this continued, uh, how this has continued, and how is her our families, our people, which ultimately makes us more understanding and willing to help others who experience this pain and fight against this injustice. Because when you start to shine truth into injustice, you start to become more understanding of those that are a part of the oppressed. It also is a building up and taking back what our ancestors have passed down to us, our identity. And it breaks down a lot of these preconceived notions that we've been told about ourselves that originated from Jackson, uh, from this machine. And lets us have an opportunity to actually relearn the things that have been passed down to us by those who came before us. It's also a recognition that we know that we are loved and that colonization is not really what defines us because we have a history that far exceeds the boarding school history. Uh, we have a history that far exceeds uh, Russian history or colon, uh, colonization that goes for tens of thousands of years. Uh, it also recognizes that our cultural identity is proof that we are never alone. Because not only do we have our communities that have, uh, have been affected by these structures of violence, but we also have the prayers uh, and the path that has been walked before us by those who came before us. Uh, because as we start to heal, they also start to heal. And when we know who we are, we begin to realize our purpose as Native peoples. And it's really important to recognize this, uh, that healing is what we, not only healing, but listening to who we are uh, from what those who came before us uh, have said about who we actually are uh, in our cultural identity. Uh, and when we start to bring this healing, uh, not only healing ourselves or those who came before us, but also those who come after us. And so for the Heritage Center, a lot of our next steps uh, is ultimately helping uh, grow our team in terms of indigenous research to be able to
do these kinds of things. Uh, and I, I could go through all of these things, but really the biggest thing for all of us at the Heritage Center is to bring healing, uh, this kind of holistic healing. Uh, from my own grandfather, uh, my, my own grandfather, uh, you know, he went to boarding school uh, and he, he didn't talk about it as much. And this is, this is the case for a lot of people. And for him, every now and then he would have this sense of clarity and he would say something, but it was at that point they realized that, you know, there, there's something a little off from this. I might be getting a little too vulnerable and that he, he would stop. And that, that's the story for a lot of, uh, you know, people of my generation. Uh, we hear and see the pain of those who came before us uh, who aren't able to actually tell this story. And it's only whenever uh, I actually started doing this kind of research that I was, that right alongside even the little things that my grandfather told me, uh, that I'm able to actually tell his story. Uh, that I'm actually a story that he was never actually able to tell. And that that's and th there is this kind of healing that comes from it, not only for me, but in telling my story or telling his story about what occurred and how it affected him. I get to bring healing to him. But also those who come after me. And so with that, yeah, uh, chicken neck, uh, man, thank you. And there, there's the long bibliography, but yeah, thank you. Uh, does anyone have any questions?